Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with us today is one of the world's foremost theologians, authors, and Jesus scholars, Dr. Marcus J. Borg. Marcus, thanks for talking with us. Good to be here. You have done more than just about anyone to help the church, especially the mainline church, wrestle with the important questions of who Jesus was and what it means to be his follower. I like what Peter Gomes wrote once. If Marcus Borg did not exist, we would have to invent him, for we have no better guide to the recovery of an authentic Christian faith for these difficult times. How did you get started down this path? What drew you into this work? Well, I I grew up in a, a Lutheran family for whom church was very important. And so I think imprinted on my consciousness from when I was a very little guy was a sense that these questions of God, Jesus, and the Bible matter enormously. And I think the real turning point for me, though, was when I was a junior in college, in a Lutheran college that had uh, required religion courses. I think we had to take six in those days. And in my junior year, a young professor named Paul Sponheim made the study of religion the most exciting intellectual enterprise I had ever run into. And the passion he brought to the classroom as well as the sense of importance uh, was the basic reason that I ended up going to seminary. Um, I didn't really plan to go to seminary, but I got one of those wonderful Rockefeller fellowships, kind of a catch-22 fellowship. (laughs) If you want one, you can't have one. (laughs) That is, they were designed for people who were going to do something else, and I was planning to go to law school. Um, But I got a Rockefeller, and within two weeks of being in seminary, Union Seminary in New York City, um, I completely gave up the notion of ever going to law school. I had Hmm. fallen in love. And I think what has made me a reasonably good interpreter of all of this is the experience of teaching undergraduates Mm. for almost 40 years. For me as a teacher, there was nothing more disappointing than looking out at a class and seeing them looking either bored or terribly confused. Mm -hmm. So whatever gifts I have at communicating this, I think I owe to my undergraduates. And, of course, I continue to think that um, these questions, God, the Bible, Jesus, are the most important questions there are. And given that the United States is still statistically the most Christian country in the world, they're also tremendously important for the future of this country. And I am um, dismayed, really, by the sharp divisions within American Christianity today. So it's almost as if we have two different religions, both using the same scripture and the same language. And I'm passionate about claiming the genuine meanings of um, our sacred scripture and of our teachings and so forth. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. One of the great frustrations many of us mainline Christians experience is that our society tends to view Christianity and Jesus in certain specific, literal, belief-oriented ways different than we may. Our media and culture stereotype Christianity, it seems, and you and a number of others are trying to address that. What would you say to mainline laypersons who find it difficult to respond to these stereotypes? How can they best express their faith? During the Q&A following one of my lectures a couple years ago, a um, professional woman, uh, probably in her mid-40s, said that if she in her workplace on Monday morning starts talking about something interesting that happened in church yesterday, nobody wants to hear about it Mm. because they assume her working colleagues, assume that Christianity is what we hear on Christian radio and see on Christian television and see in um, the involvement of the Christian right in political campaigns. So they don't want to hear about it. And she said, do you have any suggestions? And I said, well, what denomination are you? And she said, "I'm, I'm Methodist. I said, well, maybe you could say 
I'm a Buddhist Methodist. <laughs> and people might get curious about that. I think your comment is right on target. A friend of mine said, in many ways, the major obstacle to Christian evangelism in our time is Christian evangelism. Mm -hmm. For the last 30 years, I've taught in the state of Oregon, the least churched state mm. in the country. Vermont claims to be now, but we know we're still number one. <laughs> Uh, that means that roughly half of my students grew up without any connection to a church. And that half had a tremendously negative view of Christianity. Mm -hmm. They were interested enough in religious studies to take a course in religious studies. And they were interested in Buddhism and Judaism and even Islam. But whenever the unit of the course came up that was about Christianity, their body Language would change. They would sit with crossed arms. Uh, they would hardly be willing to raise their hands and become involved in discussion. They looked grumpy. <laughs> and that's because the most publicly visible face of Christianity in our time is Christian radio, Christian television, and the Christian right. And, uh, of course, mainline Christians and uh, progressive Christians, and there's a lot of overlap between those two categories, mm -hmm. uh, do not have that kind of public visibility. Um, your show is one of the few that gives visibility to the mainline. Now, you were involved as a leader in the well-known Jesus Seminar. Tell us how that work began. The Jesus Seminar began in 1985, convened by Robert Funk and John Dominic Crossan. And what led them to do that was the realization that most Jesus scholarship up to that point had been done by individual scholars who would write a book and a year and a half later it'd be published and then there might be some response to it or they'd write a scholarly article and a year or two later, it'd be published. But there had been no collaborative effort, mm. no um, opportunity to bring together 40 or more scholars, that was the number attending a typical meeting of the Jesus Seminar, to uh, be in face-to-face -face conversation about what we thought about these things. There were two reasons for the Jesus Seminar. One, to provide a collaborative opportunity for a large group of scholars to get together to see the extent to which there was or was not a consensus about how much of what is in the Gospels goes back to Jesus. So that's the scholarly dimension of it, and it was very exciting, mm -hmm. uh, the most exciting intellectual experience of my professional life. There was also a second reason and that was to raise consciousness among the general public about the existence of biblical scholarship. Hmm. For decades, many biblical scholars had been saying, biblical scholarship is the best kept secret in the church. And so we deliberately uh, invited the press to our meetings and for the first several years in particular, there'd be significant news stories every time we met. Um, it was not uncommon for there to be a front page news story on the Sunday edition of 200 or more newspapers around the country. Some of our critics have suggested that we were just publicity seekers. <laughs> well, in one sense we were, mm -hmm. but I trust not for egotistic reasons. We did want to make the general public aware there's another way of looking at the Bible and the Gospels than you may have been aware of. So as a result of the Jesus Seminar and all your studies, what would you say about Jesus? How would you describe who Jesus was and why he has any relevance to us today? In 30 seconds or less. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. I have some real shorthand ways of talking about Jesus and, and longer ways, of course. 
you can't write a 300 plus page book without having a lot to say about Jesus. Some of my shorthand expressions. I think he was one of the two most remarkable people who's ever lived. I sometimes speak of him as St. Francis with an exclamation point. Hmm. St. Francis because Francis is commonly regarded as the most remarkable and Christ-like of the Christian saints. But St. Francis turbocharged, (laughs) if you will. And of course, for Christians, Jesus is the decisive revelation of what can be seen of God in a human being. That's who he is for what is the most numerous religion in the world. And thus, for that reason alone, how we think of Jesus matters enormously because it shapes what we think the Christian life is about. By the way, this is one of the distinctive features of Christianity. Christians find the decisive revelation of God in a person. And it's the only Mm. major religion that does find the Mm. decisive revelation of God in a person, not in a book. Now, of course, the Bible is also revelation for Christians. But when the Bible and Jesus conflict, as they sometimes do, Jesus is the norm of the Bible, or in colloquial colloquial language, Jesus trumps the Bible. Mm. Well, reading the Gospels can be both an eye-opening and frustrating experience. If you read the Gospels through, the picture of Jesus that often emerges is one that, frankly, many Christians would not recognize. At the same time, there's really very little information about him in the Bible, and what is there can be conflicting or confusing. So what do you think? How should we approach reading the Gospels? I think the key to reading the Gospels, as with any ancient document, is ancient text in ancient historical context. When we set the message of Jesus in its first century world, it really comes alive. And doing so also guards against what I might call fanciful interpretations of the words of Jesus. We need to remember that the Bible and the Gospels were not written for us or to us, but they were written for and within these ancient communities. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be a highly trained technical historian to get anything out of the Gospels. But ancient text in ancient context is the place to begin. If I can give a quick example, think of some of the most familiar titles of Jesus, those exalted titles by which we as Christians know him. Son of God, Lord, Savior of the world, the one who has brought peace on earth. All of those were titles of the Roman emperor in the first century. And thus, for the followers of Jesus to use that language about him was, in that cultural setting, to commit high treason, Mm -hmm. to say, no, the emperor is not Lord. The emperor is not the Son of God. The emperor is not the Savior who brings peace on earth. Rather, this person who was executed by the empire and vindicated by God is the true Lord, Son of God, Savior, and so forth. Now, I don't mean to imply that that language has only a political meaning. And indeed, in the first century, you couldn't separate politics from religion. But it does have that edginess to it that is oftentimes lost when that language is separated from its ancient cultural and historical context. Marcus, this year saw the publication of your first novel, Putting Away Childish Things, and we have some excerpts on our website at dayone.org. The main character, Kate, is a popular religion professor at a liberal arts college, and through her and other characters, you managed to communicate a great deal about important issues of faith. 
Many folks were surprised that you wrote a novel, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. How did this book come about? I suspect that I wanted to write a novel since I was uh, a child. And uh, maybe it's the fantasy of a lot of people. And I made a couple of attempts over the years, and it never really took shape. And I think that's because I got preoccupied with the plot, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out, well, what's going to happen in this novel? And then the breakthrough for me that happened a couple of years ago is that I decided to create some characters and do brief sketches of who these people were, and then put them in a setting and see what would happen. Now, I have a vocational reason for writing fiction as well. It's, uh, as you know, the novel is a teaching novel because the characters are professors, uh, one in a liberal arts college, one in a seminary, and they're involved in the life of the church. Um, You hear them talking about things that matter. Again, big questions like God, the Bible, Jesus, um, spirituality, the religious life. And so I use the novel as a vehicle for teaching about these matters, even as I trust that it's also a decent story. So it's a fictional vehicle for teaching theology. So through this medium of storytelling, you are able to do that. But that reminds me of how Jesus usually taught through parables rather than a more didactic approach. Do you think one approach is more effective than the other in communicating the faith? Jesus was probably the greatest master of the short story, the parable, that's ever been. More parables are attributed to him than any other religious figure in the ancient world. And, of course, they're enormously memorable. And this is part of his genius as an oral teacher in a pre-print culture. So the short, memorable story is an enormously effective way of teaching. And compared to that, uh, a novel is enormously wordy. Well, what are you working on these days? A sequel to the novel, I hope, and what, what else? My next book is in the final editing phase. It will be called Speaking Christian. And it will be about reclaiming Christian language from its common distortions. It'll be published in late March. I am going to write a sequel to the novel, but it won't be my next book. In addition to speaking Christian, I'm working on what will be a chronological New Testament with the documents of the New Testament arranged in the chronological sequence in which they were written. So, for example, the seven undoubtedly genuine letters of Paul will come before any of the Gospels, and Mark, not Matthew, will be the first Gospel. And then I hope to turn to a sequel um, of the novel, uh, carrying on the story of Kate Riley and Martin Erickson and other characters as Kate moves into a um, new teaching situation. Well, I can't wait for any of those. You do a lot of traveling and speaking and teaching, and you have been in innumerable churches over the years. Where do you see the mainline church heading in the future? Maybe where should we be aiming? I think the vocation of the mainline denominations is to be the progressive voice of Christianity in our time. We have no other reason to exist. Sometimes I have heard mainline Christians say, well, conservative churches are growing, so maybe we should become more conservative. In fact, it's not true that conservative churches are really growing. They have leveled off, maybe even are having some decline as well. But for us to become more conservative for the sake of increasing our numbers, which I don't think would work anyway, would be to abandon our God-given vocation. 
mainline churches will never be as large as they were roughly 50 years ago. I think 1954 was the high water mark for the percentage of uh, Americans who were members of the mainline Protestant denominations. But I think mainline congregations will be increasingly intentional about a really serious and deep walk with God. And an intentional community of a couple hundred people can in many ways be far more effective than a conventional community of 2,000 people. So I'm not optimistic about numbers in the future, but I'm very excited about what I see happening in so many thriving mainline congregations.